All right. It is my great, great pleasure to welcome all of you and to welcome uh, a Professor Robert Lemieux, who is the Associate Professor of Communication and Cinema at McDaniel College. Um, Dr. Lemieux got a master's in communication from Michigan State University, uh, a doctorate in communication from the University of Georgia, and a master's in film and video from American University. Uh, and he also is the curator of this magnificent exhibit. He has been with McDaniel uh, faculty since 1996, and he also is a member of the Carroll County Arts Council board. Now I've been on the board for a while and during that entire time, I've sat there in awe listening to uh, Dr. Lemieux's plans for this spectacular exhibit. And in addition to being magnificent artwork, he also has pulled together an incredible partnership in the community. And it's worth going just to see, pick up the amazing catalog he has produced and to see the many, many members of our community who have participated. So Robert, thank you for this gift to the community. And without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you, Lynn. And I'm assuming everybody can hear me. <clears throat> and what I wanna do is share my screen because we have some things we wanna talk about. Let me just orient myself here with my Zoom skills. <clears throat> And just to sort of kick this off a little bit, I thought I'd give a little history since this is a historical society and, you know, to sort of orient us. Uh, animation is 120 years into its art form. And when you think about what has occurred over that 120 years, it's pretty significant. In fact, the vast majority of animation during the 20th century was hand-drawn. And in the very early years, there was you know, audiences are intrigued with animation, but production studios less so, you know, the MGMs of the world, Warner Brothers of the world, as production studios, you know, they were intrigued with it, but recognized the serious time commitment and also recognized the expense of animation. And by time commitment, I, I mean <clears throat> how, it, how much time it takes to create an animated film. Traditional film, as perhaps many of you know, is 24 frames per second. And if you think about traditional animation, all of that in the vast majority of the 20th century was hand-drawn, which would mean for a second's worth of film time, you're needing to create 24 cells or 24 images just to create one second of film time. And so if you magnify that by say a feature length film like Snow White, 83 minutes, you're topping out at a, over 100,000 hand-drawn images to create Snow White. And so from the early years, production studios are less intrigued with animation per se. Yes, they'll show it, but less intrigued with maybe having a financial commitment to it. And so in those early years, it's really just individual animators coalescing, sharing ideas, studios starting to pop up in the 1920s, Fleischer Studios, uh, Disney Studios, obviously, Bray Studios in the 1920s, as they're trying to get a grasp of how to uh, continue with this art form. <clears throat> and so what I wanted to start with is, and I'm hoping everybody can see my screen, is sort of three pieces of animation that I think speak to the history of the art form over the last 120 years. And each of these we're just going to show for a minute. And so for the first one, this From is... From the Library of Congress. So for this first one, this is the first piece of animation. And it is, <clears throat> it is called The Enchanted Drawing, 1900. And the interesting part about this is, in today's world, we don't know if we would recognize this as a piece of animation, but it is. And it sort of speaks to a couple things. First of all is the presence of the animator in the film. In the early years of animation, the animator was tended to be a key part of the film in, in terms of his presence, whether it was his just his hand showing how things are drawn or perhaps his entirety. And in this film, we sort of see that. So we'll watch this for about a minute. And this is the very first animated film. <clears throat> in Washington, DC. Thank you. 
So we get the idea. It's almost like more of a magic trick than it is a piece of animation per se. Whereas, you know, it's stop motion in the sense, obviously the animator's drawing, in this case, a glass and a bottle of alcohol and drinking it himself. And then he, you know, he gives a drink to the animated character on the, on the, on the uh, drawing sheet. And so <clears throat> this kind of reflects that very early form of animation where it's kind of very much stop motion the idea of hand-drawn cells haven't developed per se and it's and it sort of speaks to as i said a minute ago the fascination the audience had with the process the magic that's being created with animation and the animator showing how that magic occurs in this case you know it shows his entire self drawing it out in other cases in other films uh, it might just be the animator's hand but there was this great fascination we had with how the art form comes how the magic is created and so the second one I want to show you <clears throat> brings us to the middle of the century and one that some of you may be familiar with. And this is called Gerald McBoing Boing. And it's 1950s Academy Award winner. And it features a story by Dr. Seuss. And it has obviously a very different look than the one we first watched. We'll watch a minute of this, but it speaks to the interest in sort of the experimentation that has gone on in animation and the way in which we can create a unique look with animation. And this is by United Productions of America, UPA for short, which post 1950 was sort of the animation studio of keen interest for everybody just by the way in which things look. So we'll watch about a minute of this as well. This is the story of Gerald McCloy and the strange thing that happened to that little boy. They say it all started when Gerald was two. That's the age kids start talking. At least most of them do. Well, when he started talking, you know what he said? He didn't talk words. He went, oink, oink. instead. Oink, oink, oink. What's that? Cried his father, his face turning gray. That's a very odd thing for a young boy to say. And poor Gerald's father rushed to the phone and quick dialed the number of Dr. Malone. Come over fast. And so obviously that film has a very distinct style, really kind of distinct from any animation that you've seen pre-1950, post-1950. UPA was a highly influential studio weaving in sort of modern artistic elements uh, sort of violating some of the things we were taught as third graders, you know, don't color outside the lines. I mean, just looking at the image that's on the screen, you can sort of see the curtain in the background, how it's not fully colored in, how it's colored outside the lines. There's not a full sense of the entire background in terms of the entirety of the house. I mean, you get the sense that you're in interior space, the use of colors here, highly, highly influential studio. And just fast forwarding a little bit, one of the things that animation has always been intrigued with is this sense of realism. You know, how do we make animation look realistic? How do we make it look like real life? And there's this sort of debate uh, among animators in terms of, is that a direction we should be pursuing? Because animation really wasn't designed to sort of do that. After all, it is animation, but at the same time, you know, if you think about Pixar Studios, one of the things in their early years in the 1980s, they were fascinated with pursuing that idea of realism. And the advent of the digital age is what has allowed us to become that much more realistic. And so the last film I want to show you, just to give you an idea of the progression of timeline, you know, the first one we saw, uh, very rudimentary, this one, very unique look. And then this third one is actually an Oscar winner or I'm sorry, Oscar nominee, I think 2017, called The Garden Party. And we'll watch about a minute of this. And this is a piece of animation, although it may not look like it.
So you you may be wondering, well, that's uh, well, first of all, that's about as realistic as you can get. That is in terms of the spectrum of abstractness and realism, that is about as far down the realism scale as you can get. And I think this sort of three little clips that I've showed you kind of speak to that transformation of animation over the course of its over the course of the last 120 years. And this this clip that I just showed you, that realism aspect of it. Obviously, digitally, in terms of the digital age is pretty much now taken over the animation world. And, and, you know, it's hard to believe that this is a piece of animation when you look at it. And I'm not going to give away the story. I would, I would urge all of you, you know, this is available on YouTube. I would urge all of you to sort of seek out a film called The Garden Party, which was an Oscar nominee in 2017. Uh, tremendous piece of animation. And again, sort of speaks to that. Uh, idea of realism that um, the industry is some of the industry are sort of pursuing all right so we've talked about you know what it takes to create this 24 frames per second during that classic era and and by classic era i mean that hand-drawn era the digital age showed up roughly about the 1980s particularly with john lasseter and pixar studios where everything they were creating was digital and then once the 90s showed up, really pretty much everything that you see now is pretty much digital. And so we've segued from that classic era to the digital era. And the in that classic era, everything was drawn on what's called a cell. You know, a cell, short for celluloid, and a background. And we'll take a look at some of those cells and backgrounds here momentarily. Uh, but the, the cell in the early years was made out of a nitrate celluloid, which is problematic because it's highly flammable. And then they started to turn to acetate celluloid uh, right of probably the 1930s, 1940s, where they started to transition from nitrate to acetate. And that may sound a little too technical for you, but it's an important aspect because it's that cell that most people are familiar with when we talk about animation. It's that cell that you can go to the Disney store and buy cells and they'll throw in a background for you as well. And one of the aspects about those nitrate cells, because they were highly flammable, a good number of films from that early years of animation, the 19-teens, 1920s, are no longer available because they had a tendency to catch fire. They were highly flammable. Hence, the interest in transitioning away from that, right? And so from a historical perspective, since this is the historical society, I thought it'd be a good idea just to talk a little bit about, you know, that history. The other aspect I would note is that the vast majority of all animated films are shorts and have been. Throughout much of the early part of the 20th century, most 99.9% .9 of animation was an animated short. And yet most of us think about, when we think of animation, we think about the feature. Most of us think about maybe a Snow White in the first half of the 20th century, or maybe Pinocchio or what have you. But the vast majority of films were those animated shorts. And most of those had running times of about seven minutes. When Fleischer Studios, put out uh, Popeye the Sailor meets Sinbad the Sailor in 1936, that was, had a running time of 16 minutes. And everybody thought that that would be way too much for the audience to handle. And lo and behold, the audience loved it. And in fact, it was advertised as an animated feature, even though it's at 16 minutes, because it was more than double anything that had been shown previously. And it provided evidence that the audience could withstand a 16 minute animated film. And then of course, uh, a year later, we have in 1937, we have uh, Snow White, <clears throat> which is 83 minute running time. And so when we think about animation, you know, there's two perspectives, the feature film and the animated short. And that animated short had a home up until uh, like the 1960s. And that home was as the preview to the feature film when you went to the theater. And I'm guessing some of you may recall that as a child. I, I can recall as a child in the early 1970s going to a film and seeing a Bugs Bunny short prior to a feature film, maybe 1971, 1972, perhaps. And so the shorts had a home. And then in the 1960s, 1950s, 1960s, that started to become less popular because something called television showed up. And then the industry realized, oh, we can segue to television. And here's a new home for not only our new material that we're cranking out, but also some of the older material that was created in the 1930s, Warner Brothers, Walt Disney, what have you, some of the older material that was created in the 30s and 40s could now transition into television. 
And then the theaters begin to realize, hey, I don't have to pay for these animated shorts anymore. I can use my money for other feature films. So they become became less of an interest and less of a demand for the animated short prior to the feature film. And then, of course, we see the rise of television. We see the rise of Saturday morning cartoons. And so the industry greatly shifted in the 1950s and 1960s. And the ripple effect of that was that a number of production studios just started to disappear because now they don't have an outlet unless you're solely marketing yourself to television. And at that point, by the 1960s, you know, Hanna-Barbera was the king of animated television cartoons, both domestically and internationally. And so a number of production studios um, that were alive in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s just started to disappear. And really the only one that sort of, the only few that sort of survived were Disney, Warner Brothers, Hanna-Barbera, and Jay Ward to a lesser extent, and even that disappeared. <clears throat> An interesting thing, last thing I'll note from a historical perspective about television animation, is that we talked about 24 frames per second for, for when you're creating a film. Well, with television animation, the quality isn't on par with that 24 frames per second. So they might scale back uh, to 16 frames per second. And that saves a little money, obviously, saves a little time in creating the short, or in some of the even less quality television animation, they might scale it back to 12 frames per second, or maybe even into the single digits. And sometimes you'll know that when you're watching uh, animated TV, television uh, from maybe the 1970s, a Hanna-Barbera piece, and really the only thing that's moving on the screen might be the character's mouth. You know, there's nothing else moving or the movements aren't super smooth. So one of the things you should look at, you know, when you're watching animation, whether it's something from the 50s or 60s or 70s on TV or film, is the amount of action that's going on. Because that's sort of speaking or speaks to the number of frames per second that were needed to be created to create the action that you're watching. So that's kind of a little wrap of our historical tour. And now might be a good time to sort of segue into, all right, if you're creating, if you want to create an exhibit on animation, you know, how do you do that? You know, where do you go to find pieces? Because as I said, there are a number of notable historic production companies that contributed to the cultural significance and relevancy of animation throughout the 20th century. Fleischer Studios, Bray Studios, UPA Studios. Uh, I mentioned Hanna-Barbera, Jay Ward, uh, Don Blue Studios, on and on and on. And so where do you go to find that? Because today we can probably, you know, if I asked you to name some animation studios, you would probably name Disney and Pixar. And even Pixar sort of folded into Disney a little bit. So beyond Disney, where would you go to, to find art to create an animation exhibit? And the answer becomes difficult. And the, uh, and the way in which we pursued this was a friend of mine who's a curator at another museum that we had borrowed art from previously. I knew they had a small animation collection, but at the same time, I knew it wasn't large enough for maybe for a big show. And so they recommended a private collector. And I corresponded with this private collector over the summer of 2019. And it became very apparent to me that this private collector had a considerable amount of material. And I visited him in the fall of 2019. And, and we had corresponded via phone and email. And when I showed up to see the artwork that he had, and he's a very successful businessman. He'd been collecting since the early 1980s. He had 12 or 14 folding tables laid out around his house with just art laying everywhere. And it was mind boggling to think that, you know, there was this much art out there that somebody could, that somebody could, you know, collect. And over the course of the next few months, we sort of narrowed it down to 200. I think we started with 220 or so pieces. And then it became uh, widow, widow, widow. And I think we finally narrowed it down to 150 pieces of art. And <clears throat> how do you tell the story behind that art? You know, how do you start to shape an exhibit from a curatorial perspective? Well, we decided to focus on production studios, those, you know, that sort of historical aspect. And 
in focusing on those production studios, what are the stories that you want to tell about particular pieces of art? How do you tell those stories about those particular pieces of art? Because then as a kid, you start to shape the narrative and you start to shape what people come to know and learn about animation. And it becomes very uh, important that you're accurate, you know, historically accurate and so forth. And so what I want to do is just sort of show you a few pieces. And I don't know if you can see me on the screen or not. I'm not certain. Somebody can let me know if they can still see me. We see your thumbnail on the side, yes. All right, super, thank you. And so here is, or here are, some pieces that I want to show that sort of speak to, well, maybe not that one, speak to sort of the process that we've talked about that we will talk about. And so one of the first things that we do with regard to the process is we create a storyboard. You know, we storyboard everything out. How does the story unfold? And so this piece comes from Pinocchio and is a good example of a storyboard. Um, and this would be pencil on paper, colored pencil on paper. And you can sort of see the scene designation. You can see the camera designation, MCU, and you can see what who the character is, in this case, the blue fairy turning towards Geppetto and off screen saying good Geppetto. And this is a key element and really sort of represents the first element of the process in terms of how do we storyboard this out? Because the storyboard is what we're going to adhere to as we are pursuing um, the story, as we're unfolding the story. And I think this is a nice example of storyboard. And this would be just one one piece in that story where there might be you know there might be 60 of these depending on how long the film is and we know Pinocchio is a feature length film so I'm guessing there's a considerable number of storyboards particularly when you're looking here and it just says scene 21 you know we know that there are a good number of other scenes in there as well so this would be like the first stage of the process another stage a little further along would be what we call an animation drawing and this comes from a film called Flowers and Trees, 1932. Uh, and this is a significant piece in the sense it's the first Academy Award winning animated short. And it's a beautiful, mm -hmm. beautiful film. And if you're familiar with the film, you know, this is sort of the one of the final scenes where the male tree on bended knee is proposing to the female tree. And what's interesting is the ring is a rolled up caterpillar who decides to make him or herself into a ring. And during the course of the film, you see right before this scene, you see him roll himself into the ring. And it's kind of interesting because they're depicting that here on the bottom. If you can see my cursor, you can see they kind of have already depicted the motion of that caterpillar having rolled into view, being picked up and then presented to the uh, female tree. Uh, and so this would be an animation drawing and, is a, and similar to the storyboard is key. The animation drawing is key in the sense that it's helping the animator understand, giving us an idea, okay, when we transfer this to that acetate cell, this is how it's going to look. And keep in mind, this is just one of 24 images, assuming they use 24 frames per second, one of 24 images for a second of film time. So for that second of film time it took him to propose, uh, there's 24 frames here, 24 hand-drawn frames. Next in line would be a background. And for me, this is just a beautiful, beautiful piece. This comes from a film called Donald's Ostrich in 1937 from Disney. And this is a background of a train station, obviously. Watercolor, um, probably paperboard. And, you know, the background isn't the central part of this. I mean, it's a pivotal part of the scene, but it's not the central part. Obviously, the characters in action are a central part of the action. And so the character cells would be laid over top of this background. And we'll see a piece like that coming up here shortly. Uh, so the cells, that acetate cell with the characters on it would be laid over the top of this in some way. And you'll also notice at the very bottom here, these holes, if you can sort of see where my cursor are, those are registration marks. You know, to keep everything registered or to keep everything uh, even, I guess you could say, from cell to cell to cell, from second to second, from minute to minute, you know, we kind of need to know where we are in the process. And so those holes would have actually, we call registration holes. There would be pegs where the, where the background, those, those holes would slide over the pegs 
And then the cell would also have holes in it and slide over the top of those pegs as well so that we know where we are at all times with regard to movement. You know, with regard, you know, the background is going to stay stationary or it could move, I suppose. But predominantly those cells, we know where we are with regard to movement at all time because those registrations pegs are a constant. They don't move. So when we lay our paperwork over there, our background or our cell over it, we're, com we're confident that, okay, we're not too far down the boardwalk of that train, state when one, train station one way or, or the other way. And so, you know, as a background, this is just an amazing piece of art, this is, this is watercolor. And how, if you think about how many scenes there are in an animated film, or even a short, this would be a seven minute short, you think about how many backgrounds there are, how many background sets, for lack of a better word, scenes you'd have to create, by and large, those are all watercolors. And to me, this is just a beautiful, beautiful piece and speaks to sort of the art behind the art. And I say that because really you have two distinct art forms at play here. You have the film itself, which is a piece of art. And then you have all of that production art, which is what we're looking at now. This is also sort of a distinct art form that is needed to create that final film. So for me, this, this is a spectacular piece, background. And then we might have uh, a layout drawing, and this differs. You might ask, well, how does this differ from an animation drawing? Well, if you notice, if I go back, there's no background here in the animation drawing. It's just the characters. Whereas this layout drawing has characters and background. And of course, we know the seven characters as the seven dwarfs, and we see the background. And so this is also an, a pivotal part to creating the eventual background, that watercolor background, like all of this in the background, that lantern, that entrance to the mine, the tree, the bell, all of this, the little uh, pickaxe here, the shovel. I'm guessing all of that is going to be a watercolor background. And then on the cells are certainly going to be the seven dwarfs. And they might all be on the same cell, or there might be some of them on individual cells. It just depends on the action that's going to take place. Even the rabbits down here and the little squirrel, they might be painted into the background or they might be on cells. I'm guessing they're on cells, particularly if they have motion. You know, anything that's going to have motion is going to be on an acetate cell. And so this is, this is a nice example of sort of a layout drawing, again, with the background and the characters. And you can sort of see, you know, we're not even to the production stage yet. Well, we're in production stage, but we're not even into like filming the film yet. We're still just designing the look of the film and the amount of artistic talent just in designing, whether it's that storyboard we looked at or the animation drawing or this layout drawing, it's, it's phenomenal. And here we have a piece from Cinderella, 1950. And this is what we would call an inspirational painting, watercolor on paperboard. Inspirational painting in the sense like, okay, well, what's the mood we want? What's the look that we want when we're creating this particular scene in Cinderella? What's the inspiration? Like maybe you've heard artists talk about mood boards that they use, you know, what's on my mood board to create, to give me the sense of the mood I want to create when I'm creating my art. Very similar here with this inspirational painting. How do I want the scene to look from an inspirational perspective. And so this look would inspire the animators to when they're creating the actual scene that's gonna go into being filmed. And this is a nice piece in the sense that it's by a noted female animator named Mary Blair. And there aren't too many female animators period, uh, particularly in the 20th century. Uh, and she was one of the few that was highly, highly respected, worked for Disney. And we're very pleased to have like five of her pieces on display as part of the exhibit. And I believe all five are down at the Arts Council. Uh, and so this is what we'd label as an inspirational painting. And, uh, and really the image on the screen doesn't do it any justice. When you see it up close, it almost like glows. It's beautiful. And again, it would inspire the artists in terms of creating the artwork. Here we have a model sheet. And this is Lois Lane, courtesy of Superman in the 1940s. Uh, and, you know, how do we model Lois? You know, for whether it's, you know, if you look over here to the right, whether it's her facial features, profile straight on, angled, how do we model, how do we model her body, her torso, all aspects of her. 
and then even down here, what are sort of the motion aspects? How do we put her into motion? And so many of the main characters for some of these films would have had model sheets. You know, how are we, so the animators could then see <clears throat> how they're being modeled. And keep in mind, I say animators, plural, because this is a, truly a team effort. I mean, when you're doing a feature film and you're cranking out 100,000 uh, acetate cells, you have quite a bit of help. And so there needs to be consistency across that. And so the model sheet would allow us to maintain that consistency where we can use it as a guide to understanding how the character should look from scene to scene to scene to scene. <clears throat> and so this is a nice model sheet and this would be uh, graphite on paper. <clears throat> And it's actually, it's pretty good size too, as I recall, also on display at the Arts Council. And it's fascinating, even down in the lower right corner, we get very micro, you know, we talk about the eye, we talk about heavy on the lid, what the mouth looks like. I mean, it is very specific in terms of how, and you know, when you think about it historically, Lois Lane is a, is a key feature in terms of the history of animation. <clears throat> Next up, we have what's called a color model actually an animation drawing and a color model combined. And this, you see all the notations out to the side of Porky Pig and out to the side of Daffy Duck. This is notating, and I don't know how easily you can read this on the screen in terms of those notations, but this is really sort of speaking to all of the coloring that goes on in, in whether it's the clothing of the character, the skin color of the character, or in the case of Daffy Duck, the bill color, the foot color, or, or even the gun. You know, the blue gray color of the gun, if you see right here where they're depicting, you know, the blue gray color of the gun. Uh, sunflower, I guess that is. Different types of red, dark SPCL red, dark special red, maybe light special red for the hat. So uh, this is very much sort of an animation drawing slash color model where we're depicting not only the characters, but also that sort of sense of color that we're trying to weave in for each of those. Also a very nice piece. And so this would be colored pencil and graphite on paper. And at the top, you can kind of see, I mean, really not necessary in a color model, but you also see those registration peg holes as well. And so here it all comes together in really what I think is a spectacular piece of work. This is from the band concert, 1935. Uh, this might be an Academy Award winner now that I think about it. And this was what we would call the cell setup, where we, you know, we work beyond the story, board stage, the animation drawing, the color models, all of that to where we now have everything in place. And we could, you know, you could spend a lot of time looking over the detail of this piece. And this is a beautiful piece as well. But I'll just point out, you know, the muted colors of the background. You know, you see the trees in the background here. You see the canopy, it's sort of a muted color. This huge tree, the fence, the groundwork, the stage, all of that muted color is that background image. It's kind of like that train station I showed you a minute ago. It's all the background. And this, this would be a uh, watercolor background of the set, if you will, if we were creating a set. And then all of the really vibrant color would be characters on the cell, that acetate cell and in this case you know there are so many characters I can't recall how many layers of acetate cell there are here but you could clearly have quite a few of them and you know obviously the star of the show here is right in the center Mickey Mouse and if you've seen this short it's it's a it's an excellent short in terms of how Mickey's trying to orient the band and then a storm rolls in and everything goes chaotic uh, but what's fascinating here is all of these characters in color, all of them have motion associated with them during this scene, whether it's clapping or cheering, or this gentleman right here, if you can see my cursor, raising his hat, saluting, raising his hat. And so if you think about animating this from one cell to the next cell to the next cell, keeping in mind 24 cells per second, that you're having to create the motion for all of the characters that you see here on the screen. It's not just motion of Mickey Mouse, a single character. It's motion for everybody that you see on the screen. And so that's sort of the spectacularness, if that's a word, of this particular image in the sense that it is complex. There are so many characters involved here. 
and creating the action for all these characters involved here would require an, an immense amount of activity from cell to cell to cell to cell. Even if, you know, Mickey's on his own separate cell, right? And all in this group in the background might be on a separate cell. If, regardless of how many layers there are, you're still creating all of that activity and all that action. And so that sort of su suggests to you then that the more complex you get with regard to your image, the more complex you get with regard to creating that particular image. And I think this is a beautiful piece that speaks to that. You see at the bottom, the holes where the registration marks would be, where we would drop this in over those pegs to make certain everything is in alignment with the previous cell and the forthcoming cell. And this piece is on display at the Rice Gallery at McDaniel College. Really, really nice piece. Another key part to all of this is music. If you think about animation, all of it, there's a score, a musical score to the background. And probably the best example to use would probably be Fantasia. And this piece is a music sheet from Fantasia. And the impressive, really impressive part about this music sheet is, you know, not only are we talking about up here in the upper corner, what the French horn is doing, and what the bugle is gonna do, and here's what's happening in the scene, Oh, by the way, let's just create a little thumbnail image of the scene. And you see the sorcerer really small right here headed towards the castle. Let's just create a thumbnail image out of, that might be watercolor, out of watercolor just because we can and just because we're that good as artists. To me, that's, that just sort of speaks to the quality of your craftsmanship. You know, not only are you you know, creating the score, but you're creating that little thumbnail image associated with the scene associated with the music associated with that scene in particular. And there are, I think we have four of these uh, on display at the Rice Gallery. And they're all, you know, to me, they're all really, it's just an impressive piece when you look at all four of them and think that you would spend the time to create that little thumbnail image associated with each scene. <clears throat> And so that kind of, you know, I just wanted to walk you through that, mm -hmm. you know, whether from storyboard to animation drawing to background to layout drawing to inspirational painting to model sheet and so forth, all of the production elements that are in the background as we are creating that film. And for most of us, you know, when we think of animation, we think of the film. You know, rarely do we encounter the production art. And the production art, I think, stands alone as its own art form, uh, obviously tied to the film. Uh, and production art has become highly uh, collectible, definitely within the last 25, 30 years. Um, I can assure you that key pieces uh, at auction would go in six figures without question. You know, if you had a piece from, wow, if you had a piece from an early Disney piece or it wouldn't even have to be early Disney, you know, it's what, you know, what film does it represent and so forth. And that's kind of the other part to think about <clears throat> in terms of, <clears throat> you know, when you're having an exhibit and if you think about a film, an 83 minute running time film like Snow White, and you're, and you're displaying a piece of art, or in our case, I think we have about four or five pieces of art. And what pieces of art are you going to select to represent those 83 minutes of film? What, are, what would be, in your opinion, what would be the pivotal pieces of film that are most representative? And that's a good challenge. Uh, you know, I think about, I, I don't have it up on the screen here, but I think about a good example is Lady and the Tramp. You know, what's the pivotal scene from Lady and the Tramp? Uh, well, for most people, it would be that spaghetti scene, you know, just before they're ready to eat that spaghetti. Well, we're fortunate that, you know, that we have that on display. And I believe that one's in the Rice Gallery as well. And so if you think about all the films that we watch, you know, what would be the pivotal, what would be a pivotal scene from Snow White? What would be a pivotal scene from The Nightmare Before Christmas? Or what would be a pivotal scene from a Bugs Bunny short. Well, which short would you choose? You know, you think about all the Bugs Bunny shorts, which one is the most iconic? And then from within that short, what scene 
And what image are you going to take to be representative of that film? And so that's a really good challenge. You know, it's not like you're just tossing up art on the wall, animation art, but you're trying to select animation art that is speaks to the iconography of the film and the characters and so forth. Right? <clears throat> I have my clock sitting over here next to me, and I think I have about a minute left. Let's see, what else do we have here? <clears throat> I think we'll leave it at that. Oh, I know what I want to say. One final thought. This is just American animation. And that's why we have that in the title, Icons of American Animation for the Exhibit, you know, so that we're not offending the international community in any way, uh, because there is some incredible, incredible international animation out there, whether it's Canada, obviously Japan with their anime, Great Britain, France, uh, even Croatia. In fact, Croatia was the first country to win an Oscar for an animated short 1960 or 1961 uh, for an animated short. <clears throat> Up until then, it had been all US films. And so there's some incredible, incredible animation in the international community as well. And <clears throat> I'm certainly open to any questions that you have. Uh, so I'll turn it back over to whoever. Thank is. you so much, Robert. I'm sure we yeah. have a lot of questions, but one I would like to ask to kick it off is, um, compared to, say, putting together Snow White, how many artists work on something like Up, for example, compared to Snow White? Is oh, it still I, a huge uh, crowd of artists, or has oh, technology reduced that number? Um, I would say it's comparable. You know, when you look at, when you look at the credits of, a, of an animated film like Up, uh, they're about as lengthy as the credits for Snow White and so forth. Although I would say uh, that's a tough call. I'm going to say it's comparable, you know, just because we've segued from that traditional hand-drawn perspective to the digital era doesn't lessen the work. There's still the same amount of work involved in terms of creating that digital piece and all of the various people that are there. You know, as an example to Lynn's question, you know, during the traditional era, animators created what were called keyframes. What does the character look like just before he or she starts her action? And what does the character look like at the end of that action? Like maybe getting up out of a chair, me sitting in the chair, me standing in a chair. So the animator would create those two keyframes. And then they had what were called in-betweeners. They would create everything in between the people in the background, the in-betweeners that would create all the frames in between to make that scene of me sitting in my chair and then eventually standing up. And the same is true with digital. You know, they create keyframes for the action, the start of the action, the end of the action. And then the beauty of the digital era, the digitally can start to fill that in. But that said, there's still, I mean, you look at the credits of any digital film, there are a lot, a lot of people involved. Thank you so much. Now, if anyone would like to ask Robert a question, you're welcome to unmute and you're also welcome to use chat. So do we have any questions? Oh, let me peek at my chat. Well, there's nothing in there right now. <laughs> okay. Please do. Uh, please do. Uh, I have a question. Okay, go for um, it. This is Joyce Hike. Robert. Hey, Joyce. You've done a sensational job. I've only seen it at the Arts Center, but I'll be up on campus next week. Um, you know, it really was a walk down memory lane because I've seen all these old cartoons. I grew up in this era. And one of the things I remember was the sing-alongs with the bouncing ball. Yes. So could you say something about, I mean, there had to be animators who just did that, segments. Okay, that's a, a very good question, Joyce. You know, the sing-along is in the early, late 20s, early, well, once sound showed up, the early 1930s. And really that evolved from Warner Brothers Studios Warner was very interested in getting into animation, but only because they had a massive music library. All they wanted to do was showcase their music library. And so whenever Warner um, collaborated with an animator, the requirement was, well, here's the music we want, create the animation around it, which made it very, very difficult to create animation around the requirement of using this particular music. So one of the things they started doing was creating those sing-alongs. And those sort of were like the first music videos, if you will, and again, the early 1930s, and they introduced that bouncing ball to help the audience sing along and stay in tune and stay in rhythm with the song uh, that's being presented. 
<clears throat> and that became a nice feature in the 1960s television animation for children as well, 1950s and 1960s. Thank you very much. Um, we have a question from Nora Rollinson. She asked, how well regarded was animation by the film industry? Was there any struggle to get respect? Yeah, definitely so. I mean, if you think about just the Academy Award for the animated feature, I can't remember when the first appeared, the 90s, I guess that was, or 2000. It was Shrek that might've won the first one. Uh, you think of how long it took for it to be recognized as its own category. Granted, there was the animated short, but not a highlighted category at the, at the Academy Awards. So if you think about just how long it took the feature to be received that sort of recognition, that sort of, I think that would speak to that uh, lack of respect that the animation industry had. And I think, you know, part of that is because many people associated with it, associated with that sort of children's cartoons of the 1960s and 1970s. And, you know, the Disney Renaissance in the 80s and the um, rise of Pixar and the animated features, uh, particularly animated features that children and adults are interested in, sort of help create a greater degree of respect for that animated feature. Thank Good you. Um, I'm going to turn it over. Jason has a question. He has his hand up. So uh, I'll have him ask his, and then we have okay. another chat question. So Jason. Robert, can you hear me? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so when I sit down with my son, my toddler, and I have a little pad and I draw a ball and then I flip the page and I draw another ball, is that sort of just a very rudimentary example of kind of yeah. what these folks were doing on a grand scale? Sure, it's very, yeah, exactly. You know, how that ball, uh, whatever you're trying to make that ball do, bounce, thrown, bounce up, bounce down, it's just... Yeah, very rudimentary how you're getting it from the time it leaves my hand to its final resting spot. You know, what are you having it do in between those two points? Uh, and how smooth is your animation going to be in presenting that movement is going to determine how many of those pages you and your son are going to draw from leaving my hand, bouncing on the ground to rising up. Uh, and I'm going to guess, you know, bouncing ball, you know, that might be two seconds of work. So that's like 48 hand-drawn images. Wow. Uh, Fr Frank and Jenny have this question. Is there a particular piece of animation short or film that you are most impressed with technically? Wow, that's a great question. Um, you know, one of the ones I showed at the beginning in that little brief history, Gerald McBoing Boing, to me, I really like that piece because it's just so different from anything that had come along since then and that their impact was felt not just within the animation industry, but within the advertising industry. And even though that studio is no longer in existence, you see their impact to this day. And you're talking 70 years later in terms of, I mean, that, industry, that studio is revered by animators and for good reason. So I think that Gerald McBoing Boing piece to me, um, is it my favorite all time piece of animation? Uh, probably not, but just the look of that piece is completely different from anything that had come along since then. And you know, it was kind of different from anything that we see even today here in the 21st century. Wonderful, <clears throat> let's see, uh, let me see. Here's another in the chat. How is the fall off in theater attendance affecting animation? Oh, that's a great question. You know, I don't think it's affecting the feature films by any means. I think those remain popular. But if you are, if you're creating an animated short and have been creating animated shorts for the last, whatever, 50 years, you know, where do you go to find your audience? Because unless it's going to be on television as part of a TV series like The Simpsons or something, uh, and let, you know, where is your one-off animated short going to be shown? Because it's no longer as, you know, a preview to the feature film. And I think that's, you know, a, a big question that many animators face. If you think about what's upcoming at the Arts Council every year, they have the Academy Award nominated films, Oscar um, animated shorts nominated. To me, that's, you know, and that's six or seven films knowing that there are way more than six or seven films out there. 
And that's always a great event to go to because you, you sort of see uh, a, a great breadth of animated films, but at the same time, you start to scratch your head and go, okay, there's six or seven here. Where are all the others and how do I see those? And the answer is, I don't know. I don't know where you go. I don't, film festivals, I guess. I mean, I know there are specific anim film festivals just for animation, but it's not like it was in the 1930s and 1940s when you're cranking out a film that is going to be picked up for distribution and shown in a, in a major cinema as a preview to a feature film. So the feature films, no problem. The animated shorts, you know, I don't know where you find your audience. Thank you very much. Uh, anyone else have a question they'd like to pose to Robert? <clears throat> All right. Um, Wait a minute. Sorry. Here, wait a minute. We have one more here. Go ahead. Sure. So there was one kind of back in the chat um, oh. that was uh, having access to this a collector's huge collection. Did you find anything surprising, wonderful, or new to you? <laughs> uh, yeah, I would say my head was spinning after day one, and I, I spent two days with him. You know, you walk in and you see 12 or 14 folding tables laid out and the art just laying everywhere. And you just, it's just, yeah, all of it was <laughs> stunning to me in terms of, wow. Uh, and then it just becomes a matter of how do you whittle this down to something manageable? And yeah, you want to have a show with 150 pieces. Well, those aren't all going to fit in the Rice Gallery. If you've ever been in the Rice Gallery McDaniel, that's a smaller space. <laughs> We're going to need a partner, and I'm so thankful that the Arts Council was willing to partner with us. I think it's a great opportunity for them, great opportunity for the college, and I just hope people recognize um, the opportunity they <laughs> have in terms of seeing art that uh, is speaks to sort of the uh, animation history, cultural history, artistic relevancy, and so forth. It's a tremendous opportunity for people. I don't know when they would have that opportunity again. I'm having a hearing. Jan Ober has a question, Robert. Yeah, Jan. Yeah. I do. And it's actually from Alex. We've enjoyed this very much. Um, when did they start including uh, live characters in the mix with your animation? Oh, you mean like live action and animation? Yes. Oh, that's as early as that's as early as the 1920s. Fleischer really? Studios. Yeah, oh, yeah. Fleischer Studios. They had a key character named Coco the Clown and some of Coco the Clown, he's hugely popular in the 20s, some of Coco the Clown's uh, shorts would feature live action pieces where real people are in. And I'm not talking about just the animator because, you know, like the first film I showed, you could say that's live action because the animator's in it. Um, so removing the animator himself or his hand from the image, there were certainly pieces that combined animation and live action. Not a lot of them, but there were certainly some. Roger then, Rabbit did it, right? Yeah, I was going to say by the 1960s, Disney was doing some of that, and certainly Roger Rabbit would be the most and it's very popular, obvious example of that. Mm -hmm. We have a chat question. I'm in love with Isle of Dogs. Any suggestions of other animated <laughs> films I should see? This is coming from a phone number, so I can't tell you who it is, but if the person's welcome to unmute. You know, one of the things I was going to do is just create a list of films mostly shorts that I would recommend. So what I can do is I can send that to you, Lynn, and you can distribute that to people. Um, and, when, and I'll even, not just a title, it'll be the link. So you can just click the link. Most of those will be YouTube links and I'll, and I'll select those that are high quality. Uh, some pieces of animation that I think would be worth watching. So if you're interested in that, I'd be more than happy to do that. <clears throat> well, the chat is packed with people that say they would love that. So okay. you know, that would be fabulous. That would be, right. be fabulous. Before we, we let you go, I'm going to ask if anyone else would like to take this opportunity to ask Robert a question. <clears throat> okay, I think that's it, Robert. Thank you very, very much. I'm going to turn it over to Jason now. Uh, to take us out. And thank you again for your time and your tremendous information. It was fabulous. Well, you know, I appreciate it. I'm hopefully my Zoom skills were adequate. And I, you know, I appreciate <laughs> the audience. Um, and if you haven't been down to see the exhibit, please do both venues because there is quality material at both venues. Thank you again, Lynn. Thank you, Jason. Thank you very much. And uh, we appreciate everyone being here and definitely go check out the exhibit. 
And this video will be posted on our YouTube channel for everyone to see. You can take the link and, and share um, Robert's presentation. So thank you again. Thank you, Jason. And it will also be, thanks to our partners at the Community and Media Center, they will also be uh, showing this. So we're delighted and be sure to stop by and get one of the collector items catalog and uh, enjoy the exhibit. Thank you all very, very much. And I'm going to stop the Zoom now. Take care. <laughs>